So welcome everyone to a new edition of the Elena Avalar seminar, um, the first one of 2022. And I welcome as our first um, lecturer of the year, uh, Martin Ganson. Um, uh, Martin is an historian of religion, um, working in the intersections of religion and science. He and also uh, he's a specialist on the transmission of uh, and, and interchanges of astrology uh, in South Asia uh, and the reception of Persu Arabic astrology in Indian context. Um, and recently he published so in the Indian Sanskrit sources uh, on that regard. Um, and he has. Um, worked extensively on the history of astrology, not only regarding um, these Indian Sanskrit materials, but also um, materials of Greco-Roman uh, origin, as well as Latin materials. So, um, Martin, I'll, I'll give you the table and uh, welcome. Thank you. So, can you hear me all right? Sound is fine? Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so um, to start with, um, I think it's said on the, the poster uh, that I'm affiliated with two universities. So, I think I should currently, anyway, so I think I should give them both their due. <laughs> uh, so, I'm at Lund University in southern Sweden, uh, where I'm a Descent, which is more or less reader, unsalaried reader. Um, currently, I'm working at Umeå University in northern Sweden. So, um, and as as Luis uh, said, uh, I've worked a lot on South Asian Sanskrit materials, but today I'm not going to talk about that uh, side of my research. Um, our topic today concerns a prognostic method found in the earliest preserved sources of horoscopic astrology. Uh, and it's a method known as um, aphesis in Greek, as aphesis or peripatos. Uh, aphesis meaning sending out or releasing and peripatos walking around or circumambulating, if you want a, <laughs> a Latin word for it. Um, and this prognostic method was used most importantly uh, for predicting the length of a person's life, but it was also used to predict events of other kinds, good as well as bad. Um, now this method uh, is based on the daily motion of the celestial sphere around the place of observation or as we would describe it from a modern standpoint, on the rotation of the Earth around its axis. And one degree of such motion was equated with one year of life. This method is described with greater or lesser sophistication by many ancient authors, um, including Vettius Valens and Dorotheus, uh, but the, uh, the so-called locus classicus is Claudius Ptolemy, uh, Claudius Ptolemy's Apotelismatics, uh, better known as the Tetra Biblos. And this became the foundation of medieval Arabic and early modern European praxis. Uh, I might mention in passing that this method did make it to India just <laughs> just about, but it, it seems to have died within the first generation of, of transmission. It was never properly understood. So it, it never really flourished in India, but it did flourish more or less everywhere else uh, where horoscopic astrology was practiced. Now, Ptolemy, who, as I said, is, is the locus classicus of this method, he gives two versions or two varieties um, of it, uh, one of which is uh, he calls the um, actinobulia or the casting of rays, and the other the horimaya, 
that is Hori Maya Ephesus, the, uh, the hourly uh, Ephesus or releasing or sending out. And I'll share my screen with you and <laughs> see if I can explain simply what, what these two methods are about. Um, so here we go. Um, this is, uh, I think this sort of, of um, illustration will be familiar to many of you. Uh, this is a modern standard representation of uh, a, horos a horoscope or a nativity um, with just two planets in it for simplicity's sake. Um, and in, well, for those of you who, who may not be entirely familiar with it, um, let me say just quickly that the um, the main this is a two di dimensional representation of three dimensional reality, which always means that there will be some distortion. The main frame of reference here is the ecliptic, which is divided into twelve equal parts: the zodiacal signs, Aries, Taurus, and so on. Um, and that being the main frame of reference, um, we have some distortion here because the, the hor horizontal line is the horizon, unsurprisingly, uh, whereas the slightly skewed line here is the meridian, which of course in reality is, is a great circle that is perpendicular to the horizon, so it should be at right angles. But if it were at right angles, we would get a distortion of the ecliptic. So we have to choose. And in this case, um, the ecliptic is the main frame of reference. So uh, this is the horizon. This is the meridian. These 12 segments inside the circle are the 12 places or houses, as they later became known. Uh, the 12 divisions in the outer circle are the zodiacal signs. And each of those is divided into a number of parts, which we'll um, come to soon. So um, the two methods, the casting of rays and the hourly method. Uh, let's begin with the casting of rays. So <clears throat> what you do, especially if you're looking at um, a person's length of life, the first thing that you do is to find your significator. That is a point that is chosen according to specific rules to signify, to represent uh, the thing that you're looking for. In this case, a person's life force. And for a person who is born with the sun above the horizon, that is in daytime, that point will often be, not always, but often, the sun itself. So this, this symbol here is the sun. And to illustrate the, um, the method of casting of rays, the idea is symbolically to move the sun forward in the zodiac until it encounters either a planet uh, or the ray of a planet. And a ray in this case means a particular aspect angle. So that would be, for instance, uh, in this chart we have Jupiter down here. This is Jupiter. And it's in the very first degree of the sign Aquarius. So Jupiter will cast a 120 degree ray, that is a trine aspect, here to the very first degree of Libra. Um, Jupiter is a nice planet. It's a benefic, one of the good guys, astrologically speaking. And the trine aspect is also one of the good aspects. So a good aspect from a benefic planet means something good in a person's life. Uh, so if we bring the sun symbolically to the first degree of Libra, it will encounter this ray of Jupiter and something positive will happen in the person's life. That's the idea of uh, the casting of rays. Um, 
in in predicting the length of life of course uh, they were looking for the opposite they were looking for uh, nasty planets malefics casting nasty aspects nasty rays uh, which would terminate a person's life um now in astronomical reality the sun isn't actually moving around the zodiac uh or, or at least not <laughs> of course it is uh, but but not in the context of this prognostic method um what what the astrologers were actually looking for uh, was the opposite they were looking for the time when this point the first degree of libra would by the the daily motion the primary motion uh, within a few hours of a person's birth reach the point where the sun was at birth actually to be more precise about this it would never reach the exact point in the sky where the sun was, but it would reach uh, a point corresponding to um, the place where the sun was, uh, in that it was at an equal proportional distance, both from the meridian and from the horizon. So there's a symbolic motion of the sun forward through the zodiac, which in astronomical reality is measured by um, a motion in the opposite direction, the natural clockwise motion of, uh, in the North Hemisphere anyway, uh, clockwise motion of the, um, uh, of any point really, um, across the, uh, the sky, from east to south to west. The other sort of motion that Ptolemy talks about, uh, the hourly motion, is only used uh, in his in his text anyway. It's only used when the the significator is in the western part of the chart, as the sun is here. It's slightly west of the meridian. So in such cases, <clears throat> what you could do is to measure the time it would take for the sun itself to descend towards the horizon in the west and set. So in the first method, we kept the place of the sun as a fixed point and moved the rest of the zodiac across it. In the other uh, version of this technique, the sun itself is moved with a primary motion to the horizon in the west. Uh, and when it sets, uh, that would be a critical time for the person's life force. That's the theory. So we have these two sides of the same method. Um, and in, in later time, or I should say that Ptolemy calls the first kind of motion that we looked at, he calls into the following signs, because symbolically the sun is moving into the following signs. It's moving from Leo into Virgo and from Virgo into Libra. So it's moving in into the following signs and in the other method is moving in the other direction. So it's moving uh, into the preceding signs. In later tradition, <clears throat> the first kind of motion was called uh, in Latin, uh, secundum ordinum signorum, that is according to the order of the signs, or simply motor directo, by, the, by direct motion. And the opposite was then called contrary to the order of the signs or in converse motion. It's important to understand that although these are formally regarded as opposite kinds of, of motion. Astronomically speaking, they're the same sort of motion. Only one motion is used. It's the um, natural daily motion that is caused by the rotation of the Earth around its axis. 
So we're always looking at something that is moving from the east to the south to the west. Only in the first case, it's the ecliptic itself that is being moved with all the zodiacal signs being moved with it across a fixed point. In the second kind of direction, it's the, the point itself, the sun in our example, that is being moved with that same motion. But astronomically, it's all one motion. And this may seem very counterintuitive, or rather it may seem very counterintuitive to, to give two opposite names to a single astronomical motion. Uh, if you think that, then you're in good company. Uh, a thousand years ago, Al-Biruni, the, the uh, Persian polymath, um, wrote about this. And he said, um, it can be imagined from their terminology, that is the astrologer's terminology uh, and their work, that the direction is directed from the preceding point and ends at the following point. But this is not the case. Its real meaning is contradictory to that idea. It is the arrival of the following point by the primary motion to the place of the preceding point. So he, he too found this a bit annoying, the, this talk of, of direct motion, converse motion. Um, but this confusion was, was really terminological in, in nature. It was just a question of unclear terminology or, or you know, inappropriate in some people's views. Uh, in, inappropriate terminology. The really murky area was um, directions in converse motion. Um, this is where we were moving the sun itself with the primary motion down towards the, um, the horizon in the west. Um, because that was, that was not the standard uh, way of, of doing things. That was a special, that was sort of an exception to the rule. And in the medieval period, some astrologers began extending the use of such converse directions beyond lifespan calculations. And we have um, a contemporary of Al-Biruni, uh, Ali ibn Nabi Rijal, um, Rijal or, or known in Latin as Aben Ragel, <laughs> or however you want to pronounce that. <laughs> um, he, he gave some special rules for the use of converse directions. And he speaks of these directions, that, that is the normal term in Latin, direction, uh, for the aphasis. Uh, but he calls it atazir, which of course is a Latinization of an Arabic term, atazir. You know, yeah, the, the, the direction, the, the movement. And he says, note that the atazir is according to the order of the signs, so forward in the zodiac, commencing from the beginning of the sign and proceeding to its end, except among the parts and retrograde planets, the atazir of which is against the order of the signs, for it begins from the end of the sign and goes towards its beginning. So he, he says that if you have two kinds of significators, if you're looking at two kinds of points, you should actually move them conversely. You should move them into the preceding signs. And one such type of significator is a retrograde planet. That's understandable enough. A retrograde planet is, is a planet that is apparently moving backwards. We won't go into one of the whys. Uh, it happens now and then. And we have a different understanding of why it happens than they did in the medieval period when they were using Ptolemaic theories of, of epicycles and so on. But they sometimes a planet will appear to move backwards. And for such planets, Arijal says, you should use converse motion. So there's some sort of symbolic logic in that. <clears throat> But then he says, the same applies to the parts. Now, parts, also known as lots, sometimes called Arabic parts, um, are um, 
symbolic points derived by measuring the distance between two places, usually two planets, and then projecting the same distance from a third place, which is typically the ascendant. So they're, they're not bodies, they're just calculated points on the ecliptic. And it's not really clear why they should be directed conversely. They're not moving backwards. Um, and some early modern astrologers, a few hundred years later, actually criticized that idea. Um, Morin de Villefranche uh, being one of them. We'll, we'll come back to him in a bit. Um, so um, what is more um, interesting and noteworthy than, than these particular rules that Arijal gives is a number of very briefly stated examples that he lists, uh, examples of directions, some of which are in converse motion, although they do not involve retrograde planets or paths. And one of them is of particular interest. Uh, and it looks something like this. It doesn't give, the chart isn't given with degrees, but I try to reconstruct it. Uh, so this is what Arijal says. Is as an example is the nativity of someone whose ascendant was Leo and the moon was with a cardina that is nebulous star, which is in Cancer. And when the atazir, the direction of the moon, arrived at the degree of the ascendant, it blinded the native in the beginning of his 40th year. So here the ascendant is the general significator of health and well-being. Uh, the ascendant itself, that is the horizon in the east, uh, is the, the significator, while the moon, which is conjunct a nebulous star, and presumably, although it's not explicitly stated, uh, in the 12th house, which is the place of illness and misfortune, the moon is the promissor, that is the point promising, or in this case, rather threatening something that is threatening blindness. Uh, so the ascendant is the intersection of the immovable horizon with the ecliptic. And because the horizon cannot move, it's, it cannot be brought by the diurnal motion to the place of the moon, what is moved is actually the ecliptical degree of the natal ascendant which is a, in Rijal's um, example, an unspecified degree of Leo. In, in the um, illustration, it's something like 28 or 29 degrees of Leo. So that degree, so the ascendant is moved uh, up to the place where the moon was. And the moon signifying being a light, it has to do with the eyes and the sight. And being conjunct a nebulous star, it has to do with clouding, um, nebulous means cloudy, so clouding the sight, so blindness. Um, so here is something being moved, a point being moved against the order of the zodiac. Uh, so converse direction, a converse, a direction in converse motion. Now this particular brief illustration is of historical interest because it then resurfaces uh, some 400 years later uh, when it occurs in Luca Gaurico's uh, Tabulae de Primo Mobile. Uh, and Luca Gaurico was um, an Italian um, bishop, as it happens, and astrologer, um, and uh, who lived from 1476 to 1558. So he was active in the first part of the 16th century, mainly. Uh, and I have a picture of him here. This is what he supposedly looked like. Um, so Gaurico um, picks up this example from Arijal and gives a substantially modified version of it, um, which looks like this in the square format that, that he used. Um, <clears throat> In this version, uh, we have um, degrees of longitude entered in ordinal numbers for the ascendant and also for the moon. 
as well as for the midheaven and the remaining house cusps and the sun. Um, the houses are calculated according to the standard method of the time, which was the so-called rational method or the regimentalis method. Uh, and if you analyze them, you can see that they were calculated for the vicinity of Rome. So not for um, Arijal's location, which would be in, in what is now Tunisia. Um, in this chart, the longitude of the moon is obviously based on its conjunction with the nebulous stars in Cancer, which Gaurico identifies as the two Aceli at exactly zero degrees of Leo, and uh, another one at just one minute of arc of Leo. These values are not very exact by modern standards, but it's evident that they have been calculated for the 16th century uh, of Gaurico's life rather than the 11th, which is when Arijal lived. And the rising degree has presumably been arranged to put the moon indisputably in the 12th house of illness. And then the sun has been, which isn't mentioned at all by Arijal, but the sun has been placed in conjunction with the Pleiades, which is another star cluster associated with blindness, uh, again using 16th century longitudes. And Gaurico ascribes blindness in the right eye to the Pleiades and in the left eye to the nebula in Cancer. Uh, so it's, it's quite a dressed up horoscope. Uh, but what most concerns us with it is the mode of calculation that Gaurico employed for the converse direction of the ascendant to the moon, uh, which he gives at the, the bottom of this um, page. Uh, because rather than bringing the rising degree of 22 Leo with the diurnal motion up to the natal place of the moon, Gaurico actually um, calculate, calculates it the other way around, as if the moon uh, were descending towards the horizon in the east. That is, as if the, the Earth were rotating backwards or time were moving backwards. Um, he doesn't make any comment at all on this. Uh, he doesn't say, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this a completely new way. He just sort of gives the figures. Um, but in effect, what you can see if you, if you look at the, the figures is that he is, he is moving the moon anticlockwise. Um, so that every degree of celestial motion preceding the moment of birth would be equated to one year of life following birth. Now, I'm not aware of any other examples of this sort of calculation from this period. And I think there are at least three possible reasons for it, mutually exclusive. The first is that Gaurico simply may not have realized the implications of what he was doing. It may be a simple mathematical mistake. The second is that he may have realized that it was wrong, but, it was expedient and it would yield an acceptable approximation of the result of the more cumbersome method. Um, so calculation by, by the rational method of Regio Montanus would bring the rising degree to the place of the moon in uh, about 27 years and, and eight months, 27 degrees, 40 minutes, that is. Um, or the third possibility is that Gaurico actually intended, without stating it, to introduce a completely new understanding of converse motion. In my opinion, this last alternative is also the least probable because, as I said, he makes no mention of it. If Gaurico did intend to launch a new form of astrological technique, it didn't catch on uh, because over the next three centuries, the only controversies surrounding the method of directing by so-called converse motion was whether or not it should be allowed for the ecliptical degrees of the ascendant and midheaven or restricted to heavenly bodies, such as the sun and the moon. 
um, eventually the opposition carried the day. Uh, and this was largely due to the, um, the prevalence of the teachings of another astrologer who became very um, prominent, uh, Placido de Titi, known as Placidus, who lived in the 17th century. We have a picture of him as well. Not sure how historically accurate it is, but this is what we have. So um, <clears throat> Placidus um, became- Very handsome, my lay Placidus became the um, um, great authority, uh, not so much in his native country of Italy, but uh, rather in Northern Europe. Um, A slightly, a slightly senior contemporary of his uh, was Morin de Villefranche um, uh, in France, who also wanted to reform astrology a bit. Uh, and we have a picture of him here. Um, <clears throat> he actually wanted to abolish the distinction between direct and converse motion, uh, precisely because they were, astronomically speaking, the same motion. He wrote, all astrologers expound a twofold method of direction. But since in both, there is the same motion of the primum mobile and the same method of finding the arc of direction, it seems that this should not be considered a twofold direction, but a single one. Now, Morin was unfortunately too late uh, to have much influence. He wrote a massive work on, on astrology in 26 or so volumes, I think, which was published po posthumously. Uh, but uh, by the time it was, there wasn't much interest in astrology anymore in France. Um, whereas the, the writings of Placidus, as I mentioned, um, they had actually been placed on the index of the Catholic Church. They, they were forbidden, but they uh, were very well received in Protestant England, uh, where as interest in astrology was at its peak at the same time. Um, so the writings of Placidus were eagerly received. And Placidus had introduced a number of entirely new ideas although he tried to give them Ptolemaic authority, tried to fob them off on, on Ptolemy. And some of these ideas were conceptually and mathematically rather complex, which led to a certain amount of snobbery among Placidianists who looked down on the less sophisticated methods of the old astrologers, as they said. During the 18th century, horoscopic astrology almost disappeared even in England. But the last major astrological author before that decline was John Partridge. Um, and he was a Placidianist. Um, he had converted to, to the teachings of Placidus and, and was um, promoting them very eagerly. And when astrology then began to awake from its hibernation uh, around the turn of the 19th century, uh, Placidian ideas again dominated, uh, not least the, the writings of Partridge, but they were less well understood then because of this break in transmission. Some of the 19th century English language authors still understood the theoretical distinction between direct and converse motion, uh, which you can see from their definitions in their written works although they frequently miscalculated them. But other authors gave confused and contradictory instructions and some eventually abandoned directions, which by now were known as primary directions for other mathematically less demanding prognostic techniques. Um, the confusion that surrounded converse directions had them sometimes move from east to west and sometimes from west to east. And the difference between these two methods could amount to years or sometimes even to a decade or more. 
Then around the turn of the 20th century, some authors began explicitly to define converse directions as those which occurred before birth and are calculated backwards. That's a quotation from Luke Broughton, uh, who wrote in 1898, or against the natural diurnal motion of the celestial bodies. That's a quotation from this guy, known as Safariel. His real name was Walter Richard Old, and he wrote in 1915. So these definitions are clear, unambiguous, and completely divorced from pre-1800 astrological traditions. And the general unavailability of earlier texts was undoubtedly a major factor in this process of changing uh, the meaning of uh, converse directions. Once this word converse had been wrongly but understandably reinterpreted as meaning backwards in time or against the primary motion, the same idea was actually applied to other prognostic methods. Um, so each prognostic method was now equipped with a mirror image, as it was, uh, as it were. Uh, the, um, the transits, for instance, if the transit of Saturn, that is Saturn's real life observable motion in the sky, uh, in your 40th year of life, doesn't provide a satisfactory explanation for your experiences at that time, then perhaps its position in the 40th year before your birth could hold the clue. So we get a, a double set of possibilities for each prognostic technique. And we can safely say that these developments would greatly have surprised Ptolemy. In any case, this was a, a, a quick run through the history of converse motion. Um, the, uh, the interruption in the middle, I think, made me slightly lose my thread, but <laughs> I hope it was at least partly understandable. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions from my dad. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I'm sorry for that interruption in the middle. Um, so um, please, uh, we're open to questions now. Should I, should I? We have a question by Su Susan Ward. Hi, Martin. I know this isn't the. And thank you very much for your lecture, and you managed heroically. I thought. Um, thank you. I know this isn't uh, the central theme of your lecture, but I just wondered if your sources, your older sources, mentioned a particular system of timing their directions. Mm. Um, the the so-called equation of time, I think yeah. you're thinking of. Well, the, the, I'm actually not aware of any pre-modern author, as far as I can recall, of any pre-modern author using anything other than what is nowadays called the Ptolemaic um, measure, that is, one degree for one year. Um, in the early modern period, we get uh, some, some variants, the most uh, common one being the key of Nabot, um, which is very close. Uh, so so these, are, these were attempts at, at getting um, greater precision. Um, you know, if, if you found that, well, this almost matches. Something important happened when this person was 38 years old, but it should have happened according to the directions when he was 40 years old. And, and can we tweak it a bit? So you get these different theories on, on exactly how to equate a certain arc with a certain amount of time. And as far as I know, the earliest examples of that are, are from the early modern period. Although the, the key of Nabod actually has older roots, um, but, but those roots are in a different sort of technique used in, um, 
in connection with annual horoscopes, which I think would, <laughs> would lead us off uh, completely off topic if I went yeah. deeper into that. But, but I, I, think, I think this is an early modern um, development. I'm completely open to, to corrections from others, though, if, if you knew no, differently. Oh, no, thank you. Um, I was just looking at your example uh, where the, um, <clears throat> the subject became blind at the age of 40. And thank you for both, your question, Susan. Both cases, um, in both cases, the time wouldn't have measured. Um, and I just wondered if, if, if at that point there was some other other than one degree equals one year kind of method. Mm -hmm. But okay, that's fine. I, I remember I remember Morin de Villefranche uh, actually discussing this. He he used the key of Nabon, but but he has a section in his work uh, where he says that actually, you know, whichever method you use, whichever equation you use. Sorry to interrupt, but why was my video stopped? whichever method you use, um, uh, you're not going to get consistent results, but you need, you need other, you need to combine this with other methods. Yes, other techniques. Other techniques, exactly. Mm. Thank you, Martin, thank you. Other questions? I do have one. Um, um, I, I, well, it's a question. It's also uh, what I would like to hear your thoughts also, um, because this technique of directions mm -hmm. appears to become almost central to, to, to the prognostication techniques in the early modern period. Uh, we know it has a, a, a very ancient uh, origin, uh, as you, you, you mentioned. Um, but it seems to, to become almost um, important and extremely um, mathematical. And you have all those mathematical discussions and that the importance of tables of uh, ascensions. I think it's mostly in the early modern period. Uh, I think uh, I would like to hear your thoughts on that, uh, uh, please. Mm -hmm. well, <clears throat> Well, I think as as um, as I think you have discussed in other contexts, uh, in the early modern period, there is on on many um, in many ways um, there's a striving among astrologers to make astrology more scientific, meaning more more mathematically precise and accurate and and respectable, uh, in in the sense that. Um, it, it's something that you can, first of all, something that you need to be quite um, well read to to master and to understand. Um, so it's it's sort of restricted to people with good mathematical training, and and it's you know to bring it sort of on equal footing with the emerging natural sciences. Uh, I think I think that was part of the um, uh, the reason anyway. Um, and of course, there were uh, advances made in mathematics and in astronomy, which made greater precision possible. Um, so that, that would have been uh, a contributing factor, I think. Yes, um, yeah, I, I also think so, but I, I wanted really your opinion, um, because we do see the Arabs um, developing several complex methods mm -hmm. and even instruments that are able to, 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 to do this kind of calculation, you know, together with the astrolabe, uh, with special plates for the calculation of uh, several various variations of, of directions. Mm -hmm. But despite that attempt, it seems to be there from the very uh, early age. Um, I think the boom uh, <laughs> of the direction as the core uh, appears uh, when that, that this mathematical uh, um, 
the importance of mathematics, let's say, comes yeah. into play. Yeah. You, you can you can see in some of the medieval authors that they they sort of think that directions are very important, <laughs> but they tend to um, refer the the reader to other authors <laughs> for the details, meaning that they they probably they didn't you know they weren't quite up to it themselves. So they, in theory, they think it's very important, but in practice, they probably used um, simple methods like like annual perfections and, and so on, uh, mathematically undemanding um, prognostic methods for their day to day work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Does anyone else has a question or comment? I was I was thinking about about something. Um, if we could know if there was a decline of the of the practice of directions after the sixteen what was it thirty four. Uh, when the Pope forbid to calculate the length of life of someone specifically of the Pope. So was, was there, do you know, if there was a decline of the practice afterwards in Catholic countries or? I don't, I don't think there was um, uh, a, a general decline of the, um, I mean, there was, there was a general decline of astrology. Um, which was to do with, to a very large extent, uh, I think, to do with the fact that astrology in Europe had allied itself uh, with an Aristotelian uh, physics and, and worldview and, and Ptolemaic astronomy and the rest of it, which was you know, in this period imploding. So, um, but some, some of the um, reformers in astronomy and physics were also practicing astrologers. So it's, it's not a simple matter. Um, but among astrologers, I don't think there was any decline in the use of directions or in the, um, uh, in the, the practice of um, predicting length of life. And that, that was, uh, I think that continued pretty much up to the, the second, uh, second half of the 19th century, this idea that, that we find in Ptolemy, uh, who quotes it from, uh, probably from Petasiris, uh, saying that the first thing you need to do when you're looking at a nativity is to find out how long the person is going to live, because everything else is dependent on that. So that, that opinion is echoed through the centuries and it's it's right it's there right up till the well, the mid 19th century i'd say among astrologers and they mainly used directions for it You, do you have a question? Thank you. I just, um, I think it, it might be a comment as well as a question. Mm -hmm. I think talking about the prediction of the length of life, mm -hmm. whether in a Catholic or in a Protestant country, mm -hmm. I think was always prohibited um, throughout, but that didn't necessarily stop them, of course. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Martin, yes. I'm, I'm not actually sure that that would be an interesting question for, for Luis uh, and perhaps others. Uh, was it actually prohibited um, specifically predicting the length of life? I mean, ge generally speaking, you had to be careful um, about saying that your, your predictions were infallible. You had to sort of leave, leave some uh, leeway for for the will of God, but yes. but generally generally speaking, predicting things to do with the body was sort of okay because the body was subject to the sublunar influences and and so on. It was the soul that was you know free will was, was I think 
a much more sensitive issue than than length of life as such. But I yeah okay. I open to correction. It's funny that you look at um, back as far as uh, Firmicus, I think. Oh yes. <laughs> who is um, stating that it is wrong? I'm not saying it was legally prohibited, but they themselves noted it as being forbidden. But, but did, wasn't he talk, talking specifically about the emperor? Well, he may have been, but then if you look at exactly, which is almost a lift from Firmicus um, in um, William Lilly's work, he's saying exactly the same thing. Um, you should not predict on the death of your prince. Of your says. prince, exactly. But, but of some other client, perhaps. No, no, I think the ordinary person was fine. I think you could yes. tell them when they were going to die any time you liked. Exactly. But if you, if you were royal, <laughs> it was a slightly different matter. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Let me uh, um, make a comment on that. Um, um, I'm not sure exactly how extensive was this prohibition. Uh, like Tara mentioned, with uh, the bull of 1632, uh, uh, they do prohibit it for the Pope because <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a whole history on the prediction of the death of the Pope that's behind that bull. Uh, and, I, and again, extended to, to his relatives and to monarchs and princes. By then you do have a legal, um, prohibition mm. but you still see and i think there is a general prohibition the sense of prohibition around because one of my texts is i'm trying to see if it's after the bull or before the bull no it is before the bull um the author this is a jesuit author who mentions that um uh, that the um, directions i use to when the he leg is used for the length of life Oh, and then he mentions strictly, which is a forbidden technique, mm -hmm. and then has a whole chapter explaining how to do it. You know, it is a <laughs> forbidden technique, and you do it like this. And then he explains the whole thing uh, <laughs> how to do how, don't how do not this. to do it. <laughs> um, so there is some sense of prohibition, but um, other sources it is conflicting because, as you you were both mentioning. Um, it is in the border line of um, a uh, medical technique. So it can, it can also, because the length of life can be used also to assess uh, periods of illness and, uh, uh, and disease. So it's always one of the borderline issues uh, with prediction, I think. So I think further research would be needed to see exactly if it is fully forbidden, uh, to what extent, you know, to what level of practice? I think we should, that's just, it's still an open question for, for further research. Is there any other questions, comments? Well, if not, I will, would just like for you to brief, commently, comment briefly on um, your thoughts on why this technique was not transmitted um, to India and, and further on. Um, mm -hmm. What are your findings on that? I think that would mm -hmm. be curious to, to add to our discussion. It's, <clears throat> I'm not entirely sure, but um, what you can see generally if you compare Indian astrology, which of course has Hellenistic roots, uh, but if you compare it to um, what you find in the Greek language sources, um, what is lacking in, in the Indian material is this sense of motion that is sort of built into many of the uh, many of the techniques or, or prognostic methods that you find in the Greek language sources are based on taking some point and sort of mentally moving it around the nativity. That's a sort of sense of motion. And that was never, um, that was never transmitted 
into to India, um, and they they use different <clears throat> um, different methods of um, dividing life into blocks of time um, assigned to the different planets um, without this sense of, of motion. Um, it's not that they didn't have the uh, the trigonometrical understanding required to do directions. They they did, and of course you do need that in order just to cast a natal horoscope. Um, but this this on a conceptual level, there's some sort of difference there, and exactly why um, I don't know. But by the time that uh, directions do briefly <laughs> sort of come in and the the the, the highly doctrine that is the doctrine of of this significator of life that you move around uh, by the time that that does come into india with the uh, the perso arabic uh, wave of transmission um, india already had a history of about a thousand years of of horoscopic astrology and it sort of viewed the new elements through the lens of the established tradition and misunderstood um, the technique. And, and then it seems to have sort of um, withered and died. <laughs> so um, I, I can't really explain the basic conceptual difference, um, why that should be. It's, it seems that some some parts, I mean, most parts of Greek language astrology were transmitted into India with the first wave of transmission. They they have the same zodiac, the same zodiacal signs, the uh, the twelve places. They have aspects, although the aspect system was a bit garbled, uh, apparently in transmission. Um, they have subdivisions of the zodiacal signs. They have most of these things, the dignities and so on. But there were some parts that were not, um, not part of, of the, the original transmission. And it seems that the, um, this original transmission, it may have been just one text or, or just uh, perhaps a few, very few Greek language texts that were transmitted into, into India and the whole of Indian astrology was sort of built up from that. So whatever wasn't in those particular texts uh, was never uh, never incorporated. Uh, so there are some other things as well that, that are missing. Um, yeah, that's, uh, sorry, that, that's just a half an answer, but, but it's as much as I can. Yeah, well, thank you, thank you. Um... Any more questions, comments? No, um, apparently no. So <laughs> I uh, again, again, thank you, uh, Martin, for for this wonderful talk. Uh, it's a pity about the interruptions, but uh, uh, in I think everywhere everything went uh, well. <laughs> Otherwise, moving otherwise, yeah. <laughs> well, thank and, you for inviting uh, me, and thanks everyone for listening. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, everyone, and I'll hope to see you in future events. Right. Bye.